All right, we're going to cover section 19.2, which is over patterns and processes of evolution. So again, remember during the screencast, if you need to go back and listen to something again, um, that's what's so nice about these recordings, right? Um, so adapt, adaptation, extinction, so we're going to be talking about um, extinction, like mass extinction in a bit. Um, the emergence of new species with different characteristics can serve as like raw material for macroevolutionary change, which means like big change. Um, within a clad. A clad we'll talk about later is like a group of um, related organisms or species. Um, if the, so if you're looking at whether something's going to um, go extinct, um, well if the birth rate of a new species in a clad is equal to the death rate, so there's like no net change, um, then the clad will survive. However, if the death rate of the species exceeds the birth rate, then the clad will eventually die out because we have more more than dying than being born. Um, so in some cases, the more varied the species in a particular clad are, the more likely the clad is to survive any sort of different environmental change it might um, encounter. So for example, the clad reptilia is one example of a highly successful clad or you know related groups of organisms. Um, it includes living organisms like the crocodiles, but also included like dinosaurs and the surviving members of the dinosaur clad, the birds. Um, so patterns of extinction, there's like two basic types. Species are always evolving and competing, and some species become extinct because of the slow but steady process of natural selection, um, referred to as background extinction. However, in contrast, max ex mass extinction affects many species over a relatively short period of time. So if you look in um, kind of Earth's history, there's spikes of mass extinctions that happen um, over time. So um, as you can see here, the rate of extinction has changed over time. Sometimes, yeah, you'll see these like little peaks every once in a while in our history. Um, in a mass extinction, entire ecosystems vanish and the whole food web or whole food webs collapse. So species become extinct because like, for example, maybe their environment breaks down and the ordinary process of natural selection can't compensate quickly enough for that. So um, you can't you know, adaptations don't arise fast enough in order to adapt to a new environment. So if your environment breaks down, um, natural selection is a very slow process. Um, it won't, doesn't have time to actually, you know, help the species out to survive. So until recently, researchers looked for a single cause for each mass extinction that you saw in that graph earlier. For example, um, geological evidence shows that the, at the end of the Cretaceous period, a huge asteroid crushed in, crashed into Earth and caused global climate change because of, um, again, a bunch of like dust going into the atmosphere and blocking up the sun. Um, at the same time, the dinosaurs and many other species became extinct. It is reasonable to infer then that the asteroid played a significant role in this mass extinction. Many mass extinctions, however, were probably caused by several factors working in combination like volcanic eruptions, continents moving that we'll see in a bit, um, or that we'll see in this unit, and changing sea levels. So kind of some interesting things here. After mass extinction, obviously biodiversity is dramatically reduced. However, it kind of creates a, like a clean slate. So extinction, however, offers, a, offers new opportunities for survivors. So as speciation and adaptation produce new species to fill the empty niches, um, biodiversity recovers. So that's, for example, mammals. Um, we probably would not be here if the dinosaurs did not come extinct. So mammals, small mammals, um, some small mammals survived when the dinosaurs became extinct and they um, kind of proliferated and filled in these empty niches that the dinosaurs um, left. So this re recovery takes a long time, typically between like 5 or 10 million years, um, which is a small time in geological time scale, but for our time's sake, it's a long time. Some groups of organisms survive a mass extinction, like for example, mammals um, was one group, while other groups do not. So we're going to talk about different rates of evolution, different patterns of evolution um, in the next few slides. So there's one type called gradualism, so like gradual. So gradualism involves a slow and steady change in a particular line of descent. So here's the ancestor, and then slowly, time is the y-axis, slowly over time, we see different genetic changes, which is on this x-axis here, um, 
arise. So the fossil record shows that many organisms have indeed changed gradually over time. So gradualism, slow and steady. Punctuated equilibrium, um, the pattern of slow and steady change does not always hold. Um, horseshoe crabs, for example, have changed little in structure from the time that they first appeared in the fossil record. So this species is said to be in a state of equilibrium, which means that the crab's structure has not really changed over a very, you know, hasn't changed very much over a long um, period of time. So like punctuated equilibrium, a little different than gradualism, is a term used to describe equilibrium that is interrupted by brief periods of like more rapid change. Um, so the fossil record reveals periods of relatively rapid change in many groups of organisms. Some biologists suggest that most new species are produced during periods of rapid change. So here you see like um, over a very short period of time, boop, a new kind of species arises. And very short period of time, boop, another species arises. So that's punctuated. So think about maybe when you're getting punctured, like getting a shot. They try to do that very quickly, hopefully. Um, so that's how I kind of remember punctuated is like a very fast rapid change of, um, over time. So um, rapid evolution may occur after a small population becomes isolated from the main population. Um, so we'll be talking about this next unit with Darwin's finches, but um, this small population can evolve faster than the larger one because genetic changes spread more quickly among fewer individuals. Um, rapid evolution may occur or may also occur when a small group of organisms migrates to a new environment. That's what happened with Galapagos finches, also known as Darwin finches. finches. So these two finches um, came from an original finch that was on the mainland, um, and then on the Galapagos Islands, based on the environments that are on the islands. One, you know, there might have been some islands that are drier, some that are more um, have more rainfall, and based on the types of seeds, different um, finches evolved based on those adaptations of opening the seeds. So we have these different finches that um, arose from one original um, finch that was on a mainland. Mass extinctions open again, um, we talked about this earlier, um, ecological niches, niches um, created new opportunities for those organisms that survive. Um, groups of organisms that survive mass extinctions evolve rapidly in the several million years after the extinction because now they have this new um, this new kind of ecosystem open up to them without very much um, predation or predators trying to eat them. So not as much competition from a predator. Um, okay, so we're gonna talk about two patterns of macroevolution, um, like adaptive radiation and convergent evolution. So adaptive radiation um, studies often show that a single species or a small group of species has diversified over time into a clad containing many species. Um, these species display variations on the group's ancestral body plan. They often occupy different ecological niches. Um, these differences are the product of adaptive radiation, which is an evolutionary process by which a single species or a small group of species evolves over a relatively short time into several different forms that live in different ways. So here's a picture of what, rapid rate, what adaptive radiation looks like um, so there was, you know, like an ancestor, a ma mammalian ancestor, and over um, changes over time of where organisms ended up being in different parts of the world, you had these different types of mammals arise that obviously all these mammals look quite different from one another, um, arise from one actual like ancestral mammal. Um, so that's an example of adaptive radiation. So from one species, um, many other different species arise from one ancestral species. Um, so adaptive radiation may occur when species migrate to a new environment or when extinction clears an environment of a large number of inhabitants. So species may also evolve a new feature that enables it to take advantage of a previously unused environment. So um, we saw that with all the different organisms we saw in the last slide. Um, dinosaurs flourished for about 150 million years during the Mesozoic era. The fossil record documents that during this time, mammals diversified but remained small. So after most dinosaurs became extinct, however, and adaptive radiation began, 
and produce a great diversity of mammals in the Cenozoic era. So now we had these different ecosystems available um, where mammals, when they first were small, now they were able to diversify and get bigger without the dinosaurs there. Um, so some modern adaptive radiation, so both Galapagos finches and Hawaiian honey creepers evolved from a single bird species. So both finches and honey creepers evolved different beaks and different behaviors that enabled each of them to eat different kinds of foods. Um, so then they were able to adapt to new environments that um, the new environments that they encountered, they adapted to them and now they had different physical features that led them to being new different species from the original um, species that they came from. Um, convergent evolution, sometimes groups of organisms evolve in different places or at different times, but in s similar environments. So these organisms start out with different structures, but they face similar selective pressures. In these situations, natural selection may mold different body structures in ways that perform similar functions. Because they perform similar functions, their body structures may look similar. So evolution produces similar structures and characteristics in distantly related organisms through the process of convergent evolution. So um, this occurs in both plants and animals. So for example, mammals that feed on ants and termites evolve five times in different five different locations. And you can see all these different ant-eating organisms. Um, they develop powerful front claws, long hair, the snout. Um, so they might not be very, very related, but they have similar features that let them adapt to um, eating um, ants based on um, similar environmental selective pressures. Another example, um, placental mammals that we're used to seeing versus marsupials, which are a type of um, mammal, but they don't have a placenta. Um, they have a short gestation period for their babies. Um, but you can see based on selective pressures of um, different environments, we see that they have similar features. So the mole here looks like the marsupial mole in Australia. Flying squirrel here looks like the flying phalanger, which is kind of like the squirrel in um, um, Australia. Same thing with the mouse and marsupial mouse. So um, they have similar features based on um, evolving in similar environments. Um, so we're gonna talk about co-evolution in the next few slides. Sometimes the life histories of two or more species are so closely connected that they evolve together. This process is called um, co-evolution, where they evolve in response to changes in each other over time. So for example, flowers and pollinators, um, co-evolution of flowers and pollinators is common and can be led to unusual results. So for example, Darwin discovered an orchid whose flowers had a 40 centimeter long structure called a spur with a supply of nectar at the bottom. Darwin predicted that some pollinating insect might have some kind of feeding structure that would allow it to reach the nectar. Darwin never saw that insect though, but however, 40 years later, researchers discovered that a moth with a 40 centimeter long feeding tube that matched Darwin's prediction. So that was a co-evolution um, in order for that moth to get that nectar. Um, this moth species evolved over time to get a very long, um, feeding structure. Plants and herb, herbiv, it, ah, herbivorous insects um, also demonstrate close uh, co-evolution pattern. So many plants have evolved bad tasting or poisonous compounds that discourage insects from eating them. Um, once plants begin to produce poisons, natural selection on herbiv, ah, this is a hard word, herbiv, herbivorous, there we go, insects favored any variants that could alter, inactivate, or eliminate those poisons. Milkweed plants, for example, are toxic, but monarch caterpillars not only tolerate the toxin, but they can store it in their body and they actually use it as a defense against their predators. So they can use the poison that's in the plant and use it as a poison for themselves to fend off their own predators. All right, that is it. So again, if you need to um, go back or um, re-listen to something, by all means, please do that. So I was kind of going trying to go fast through these. Um, all right, thanks.